So our keynote speaker tonight is Martine Rothblatt, PhD. She is the co-CEO of United Therapeutics, and she is a tremendously innovative and accomplished trans woman. Uh, I'm it's amazing some of the things she's done. She has a stellar record of creating new advances that have enhanced the lives of all of us. I think there's very few people whose lives have not been touched by some of the things that she has done. Uh, one of her early projects was conceiving up and starting the uh, Geostar satellite navigation or GPS uh, system. Uh, then she thought up and started the Sirius satellite radio uh, system. And now she is working on a company she started up called United Therapeutics, which works to save the lives of lung disease sufferers. Uh, she's also got a project she's working on and has joined up with the Mayo Clinic on developing um, rehabilitating lungs so that they can be transplanted, uh, lungs that were not uh, up to quality. She's also working on resequencing the pig genome so that we can have a unlimited supply of transplantable organs of all matter. Uh, she's also very interested in artificial intelligence. Uh, she's written several books. Uh, uh, two that are of particular interest tonight are called uh, From Transgender to Transhuman and Virtually Human uh, um, and The Promise and Peril of Digital Immortality. So her talk tonight is called From Transgender to transhuman, to virtually human. And in her talk, she'll lay out her vision for a future in which gender, my, gender dimorphism becomes obsolete, human bodies become optional, and human consciousness has the potential to become immortal through advancements in artificial intelligence. That's my summary of it. She'll give you a much better version of it in a moment. All right, so please join me in welcoming Martine Rothblatt. So um, if transhuman people were to access something like this, um, they might go to a doctor and say that, um, I feel I have uh, not gender uh, euphoria, but I have kind of geno euphoria. Um, I have a sense of um, that I would really only feel free if I could transcend my genome. And uh, perhaps medical professionals could then provide these individuals with kind of a uh, bill of health that says if this individual uh, wants to have a surgery to radically alter their body, to do something to their body that's not contained in their DNA, that uh, this is something that surgeons should be permitted to carry out because the individual has expressed this desire persistently for, say, over a year. Some examples of uh, geno dysphoria, in other words, a, a, or geno euphoria, you can use either term, depending if you want to be like medical about it, it might be geno dysphoria. If you want to be um, empowering about it, it might be geno euphoria. Um, like I mentioned, contact lenses. Um, well, you know, probably the healthcare system will not pay for you to get contact lenses that are not medically necessary and don't look really like blue or brown or hazel eyes. But um, perhaps if a psychiatrist or a mental health professional said that was really essential to your well-being, perhaps, perhaps the healthcare system should pay for that. Facelifts, uh, face modification, uh, generally speaking, the healthcare system will not pay for anything like that. Uh, but perhaps if the healthcare system was more progressive and understood about geno euphoria and dysphoria, um, they would say, you know, this individual really doesn't like the way their face looks. Um, they're, not, they're not that happy. They're depressed. Um, and to be happy, they should have a change. And then ultimately, something as radical as mind uploading once um, consciousness operating software is developed. So there are some benefits to medicalizing genodysphoria. Um, in the case of um, a sex change, uh, without doctors giving you kind of a clean bill of health, people feel in society it's immoral, just you know, willy-nilly change your sex. But if doctors say, oh, it's, uh, it's therapeutic, then the legal system accepts it. Um, addictions. Um, if there is no uh, medical consensus that your addiction is due to something in your DNA, 
uh, then people just say, oh, this is a self-destructive individual, can't control their, um, their addiction. But as soon as there is like a medicalization of an addiction, like saying that, well, this individual has an alcoholism disorder, um, then there's a lot of acceptance and support in society and the medical system will pay for people to help bring their addiction under control because it's thought to be without something they didn't choose, just a neurochemical imbalance. A uh, similar thing back in the day, in the uh, previous century, uh, people said gay people were immoral. And uh, then finally, the uh, psychiatric associations um, proved scientifically that uh, being gay uh, was no different in terms of um, people's psychological health uh, than being not gay. And uh, just being gay, gay was something that was just embedded in people's biology and physiology. It's just another way to be. And uh, with that medical and scientific input, um, gay rights proliferated very quickly and, and there was you know, social acceptance of gay people. Same situation with you know, obesity and you could go down a long list of these things. Um, the one that has not yet occurred though is with uh, being uh, technologically transhuman. If somebody says that, you know, I want to uh, change uh, my body um, away from its DNA, uh, people will say that today, people say that the individual is just crazy. Uh, but perhaps with medical and scientific input, understanding that different people have a, um, that their identity is not in their body, their identity is, is in their thoughts and their beings. And if they have a visual uh, perception of themselves as being different than what their DNA gives them, then it's just therapeutic to allow them to change. So we're not there yet, but perhaps we'll get that direction. Jameson Green. Hi, hey, Jameson. How are Good you? It's so great, great to see awesome. you. It's been such, it's, I think it's been about 20 years since we've exactly. actually talked to each other face to face. And this is a pretty good alternative. Not, I still would love to be sitting down and having a coffee or a beer with you like we used to do, but one day maybe. Um, I just, I loved your presentation. I totally agree with where you're going with everything. And I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to say, I don't know if you're aware that I am now the president of WPATH. And yes, that's so awesome. <laughs> and the standards of care do not say what you say they say in your presentation. They say you don't have to go from male to female or meet some obligation of somebody else's idea of what your gender identity needs to be. They say that their obligation as professionals is to help you come to the determination of what it is you want to do and help you to do it. So that's way different I, than they used to be. So I just I'm so glad, I'm so glad Jameson that, that you um, corrected me on that because um, I think that's a world of improvement I'm so glad that finally us transgender people finally took control of that <laughs> process. Yeah. And I'm so glad that you're, the, that you're the leader of the group. Thank you very much. And keep on trucking. Thank you. I will. I can't wait. And I'm going to pick you up on that beer and coffee. Okay, good. <laughs>